Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares, a weekly webcast series addressing a wide variety of topics to support family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver who became a certified Alzheimer care consultant and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which include Dr. José Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Freed, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. Today's webcast is made possible thanks to the Zeller Family Foundation. Today, we will be discussing the latest research on Alzheimer's disease. And it gives me the great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Serge Gauthier. He's the director of the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Research Unit of the McGill University Center for Studies in Aging. He is also a professor in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Psychiatry and Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Goche will provide an update on the latest and most promising research on the detection and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Welcome to the show. Merci Claire, good to see you again. I'm so happy to have you here, and I have the privilege to count you as one of my colleagues in our wonderful program. Um, so I think to begin, uh, I really want to acknowledge the current pandemic. And, you know, based on a CBC News report of about a week ago, it stated that the majority of deaths in long-term care centers were of those seniors who had dementia. Can you explain why? Well, there's probably multiple reasons. Uh, the most obvious is that, unfortunately, many people in living in long-term care have dementia, whether it's diagnosed or not by the family doctor. And um, some of them, uh, it's an unusual perspective, but it was in their advanced directives that if they have a new illness or a severe condition uh, and uh, COVID pneumonia would qualify as such, they don't want to go to the hospital. So it's partly in response to their wishes that they were not transferred to intensive care. But the sad thing is many of them died without their family members around. And I guess as well, you know, when they're feeling unwell at a certain at a certain level of the disease, they're unable to let anybody know how they're feeling, right? So it's not as if they can signal a healthcare worker to say, I'm not feeling well, or so I, I, I'm assuming that many of them were hit by the disease without even having to really explain themselves or you know, ask for support. Indeed, yeah. Um, all right, so today's topic is research. And I think I'd like to begin by really understanding your role uh, in, in Quebec in research, uh, also explaining the McGill Center for Studies in Aging, what role that, that plays. And apparently we have one of the largest brain banks in the world, so I can yes. take it away. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for uh, giving me a chance to say a few words about the McGill Center for Studies in Aging. We just celebrated uh, last week our 35th anniversary. Mm -hmm. It's an initiative of uh, Dr. Jacqueline McLaren uh, way back 35 years ago, before geriatrics. It was called Gerontology, and it was a dream of Jacqueline to have a multidisciplinary approach to aging. And over the years, uh, fast forward, uh, we became... Um, an international center for research on risk factors for brain aging, while maintaining interest in other aspects of uh, aging as a whole. And uh, more recently, we've had the um, opportunity to work with a cohort, a group of volunteers for the past four years. And um, this has led to some important uh, discoveries that I'll outline in the research report. But I want to emphasize the importance of uh, volunteers in research. Uh, healthy people who just want to contribute to aging research, people who are healthy but are worried because of family history of dementia, or people with minimal symptoms who are ready to give time and blood and spinal fluid so we understand better how the brain is aging. So and when they die, or... and the brain bank. Yeah. And yes, many and the of them, <laughs> they know that there's a brain bank at the Douglas, indeed, a long history. Uh, it's one of the largest. Uh, it's interesting to know that culturally, French Canadians agreed to give their brain. Uh, it's in their will for many of them. And it's mm -hmm. very important when you participate in research on brain aging that we can look at the brain uh, 
after you die because we can confirm the observations made during the life of the person. So it's a tradition. We have a network to pick up the brains. It's always Friday night for some reason, but we have a way to mm -hmm. collect the brains and uh, they're stored in a special way that they can be kept um, uh, useful for research for up to 30 years after you die. And I'll give you an example. We saw a young man in his late 20s, and I had taken care of his mother who died in her late 30s of an unusual dementia. I, we still had parts of her brain in the freezer. Mm. And we discovered, thanks to the child, that they have the same genetic condition, which is very similar to the first case of Alzheimer way back in 1909. So, yeah, uh, very precious, uh, not just for research, but even for family. If you get symptoms 30 years later, we can still use the brain. Do you have to be a certain age to participate in the study? Uh, for the observation study, for now, you have to be 60 and over because uh, it's not useful to study younger people. There's just nothing that will happen to their memory unless they have special genes. Mm -hmm. So there's another program we're part of. Uh, it's a worldwide program for dominantly inherited Alzheimer network. Um, for those who watch French TV on Mondays, uh, let, th there is a, such a story at eight o'clock, uh, a lady uh, in her early 50s who has familial Alzheimer and the stories about her children, how they yeah. lived through the risks and all that. So there is a separate program for younger people. They have to have a special gene causing Alzheimer at very young age. But for most people who have non-genetic type of Alzheimer over age 60 is where we look for volunteers. Well, actually, actually, then I'm going to ask you the, one of the other questions was, you know, what have you learned with regards to the most significant risk factors? Do genetics play a role in this? Fortunately, uh, genetics are not so uh, pertinent for most people over age 80. Between age 60 to 80, there is one common gene that increased the risk, but without causing the disease by itself. It's well known, it's a discovery by Jude Poirier at McGill uh, some 20 years ago. It's a gene that has to do with cholesterol transport. It's easy to measure, you just do a cheek swab or a blood test, it's cheap. So far we don't screen for this in routinely because um, it's sensitive genetic information. If you have both copies of the weak gene, all your children have one copy, they may not want to know that. But as soon as we have new medications that take out the amyloid from your brain, we will need that test to see what kind of drug you need and what's the dose to be uh, used. So what, in terms of like lifestyle, what would be the biggest risk factors that I could do to, to I mean, I don't wanna talk about prevention right now, but what would be yeah. like risk factors in terms of, of, of behaviors? So genetics aside, except for rare cases, um, indeed, everyone who's aging, if they live long enough, will have some kind of memory decline. And if you look at the brains of everyone over age 90, we do have the proteins that you see in Alzheimer, but not everyone has symptoms. So you need another factor to have dementia, such as small strokes, Parkinson-like mm -hmm. changes, other protein changes. We know now from experience that prevention of stroke will delay the risk or reduce the risk and delay the appearance of symptoms even if you have the Alzheimer pathology in your brain. So in Ontario, they already showed that by controlling, by like prevention of stroke, essentially, through control of vascular risk factors, not only do you reduce stroke over 10 years, you start to see less people with dementia in Ontario. So hmm. as you said, prevention of stroke, heart attack, what's good for the heart is good for the brain, no issue. Worldwide, this is the strategy that we can use now, low cost. In other words, watch your blood pressure, cholesterol, exercise more. Now, the interaction with uh, other people is another factor, which is not well explained. Uh, but yes, if you interact with people, like, like being part of a book club is better than just reading books. Interaction mm -hmm. with people is very important mm -hmm. in some way. Um, other factors, uh, metabolic syndrome. So um, a diabetes may be a risk factor, but if you control your diabetes well, and you prevent other risk factors for stroke, you may level off the risk as you get older. A couple of weeks ago, I did a webcast with Dr. Petito on the, on the um, impact of uh, um, brain injury, concussions. So yeah. in, in your practice, have you seen a lot of athletes who suffered concussions that which have led to dementia? Only one boxer. And so it's not in the usual clientele that we see right now over age 70. But 
now there's interest, as you say, uh, what happens to young people who have repeated concussions? Uh, there's a, there are groups of studies uh, being done um, in the United States and probably elsewhere in the world uh, to see if they're more at risk, not necessarily of Alzheimer, but some kind of cognitive decline with age. You know what I've always found fascinating? I mean, I've, some of the clients that I've worked with, you could see a long history of Alzheimer's, like their mother had it, their grandmother had it, but then other people, there is no continuum. I mean, why is that? You know, because I mean, I get asked the question all the time, since my mother had Alzheimer's disease, do I want to get tested? And yeah. But how, how come some people get it and it's and others don't? Well, there's different ways to look at this. The I would ask you, how old was your grandmother when she had dementia? If she was over 90, well, it's one person in three. So it's not a genetic risk for you. It just means she lived long enough. You may ask, uh, how come nobody has Alzheimer's in your family? Well, they all died too young. Oh, or good news, they may have protective genes. There's a, some of them, not many, but one in Iceland is remarkable. It, takes, uh, it cancels off the bad genes we know of. And it's so impressive that we are try trying to find a medication that will mimic the effect of that protective gene that we found in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, some families apparently are protected and it may be genetic protection. It may be lifestyle. In Japan, for instance, um, people live long and there's maybe a bit less uh, Alzheimer, a little more stroke related dementia. And maybe it has to do with green tea, their lifestyle, sushi, who knows? But mm -hmm. that's changing because of the stress <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. of life now in Japan. And uh, there may be changes in, over time. This is the other message for the people who are interested in the field of um, risks. Uh, it changes over time. So there's generation effects. In other words, uh, our generation, Claire, we went to school longer. We're more mm -hmm. active physically. We eat better than our grandparents. So mm -hmm. our risk of dementia is reduced automatically already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's difference in uh, from generation to, to, to generation in terms of uh, environmental risk. So let's talk about now, like in terms of research, why has it been so difficult to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease? To make a long story short, we thought it was all amyloid and we know now it's not the case. We thought it was all tau and we know now it's not the case. You need at least three factors to create the environment in the brain for dementia with exceptions. Like if you have the gene that causes Alzheimer's at age 40, amyloid is clearly the main factor at play. And this is why we were so hopeful for the recent clinical trials for these young people using anti-amyloid drugs. Most people over age 70, amyloid is required to get Alzheimer's dementia, but it's not sufficient. Tau, that's a change within the nerve cell, also is required, but it's probably not sufficient need a third factor that may be small strokes. We talked about that. that that's partly pre preventable with lifestyle changes, prevention of stroke, etc. And the other proteins are now discovered to be important. The one associated with Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein is one. And there's a not a very popular protein until two years ago, TDP43, that seems to be involved with people over age 90 who have a different kind of Alzheimer, more memory, a smaller, a slower progression. It's a gentler kind of progression. So to all this to say, um, what we call Alzheimer's disease may be very different in a 40-year-old, a 65-year-old with APOE4, 4 in the family, an 80-year-old and a 95-year-old. And not one treatment will work for all these people at different ages. Mm -hmm. So, but what is what role does medication play? Because I remember when my mom was diagnosed at the beginning, she was given Aricep, and I'm sure there's some other drugs now. I mean, like what? How long? I mean, does it really prolong? I mean, not prolong, but does it? Is it? Does it really like stop the disease from advancing for a certain amount of time? Like, what role does the medication play? Okay, so these medications are symptomatic. It's like L-dopa for mm -hmm. Parkinson. So donepezil or Aricept is one of three available for more than 10 years. They increase acetylcholine in your brain. And actually they work better in other dementia such as Lewy body, Parkinson type of dementia because they have even less acetylcholine in their brain than people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so about half of the people who take these medications early in the course of disease have some improvement of their awareness of uh, things, uh, interest in doing things, memory a little bit. 
they may be stabilized for a year in terms of uh, progression, and then there's a decline parallel to what if they had never taken the drug. There's debate in some countries whether it's worth paying for these drugs, but they're relatively cheap. It's in the order of $30 a month, and um, they do uh, keep people at home longer. That's been established, but they don't make you live longer. Um, there's another kind of medicine called memantine, discovered in Austria, now made in Montreal, which is used in the more moderate to severe stage of dementia, mostly for agitation and losing your speech. And it's been shown to delay progression uh, in terms of um, losing what you, your remaining abilities to take care of yourself. So memantine is used in our milieu uh, in moderate to severe stages of, of dementia. This is all we have for now. But we also have antidepressants, antipsychotics, mm -hmm. if needed. I think the breakthrough in care has not been the drugs for the past 10 years. It's what we tell the families, um, the support we give from the community. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still more to do. We can talk about that if you wish. But we mm -hmm. can improve the care even if we don't have a good drug, a new, good new drug in the next two years. So apparently this morning you had a very exciting meeting um, with the World Dementia Council. Yes. Can you tell us about Talk that? Talk about timing. Yes. It's like you knew. So <laughs> like the, wor <laughs> the World Dementia Council was created about five years ago uh, in England. Uh, and it just happens today was uh, the first virtual meeting of the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the research workshop. And uh, we made a um, sort of an overview of the field. And good news, the blood markers in the, the, the plasma, the part of the blood, uh, we discovered that here in Montreal uh, at the same time as the Swedes, uh, and we use their same technology. So we all agree, I think, pretty much around the world that there's a way to confirm you have Alzheimer's disease with a blood test. You don't need a spinal mm. tap or a scan of mm. the brain. But this is for people with mm. symptoms. The debate that will come is, should you know before you get symptoms if there's no specific treatment yet to offer? Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the separate issue. But diagnosis will now be easier, uh, possibly at the general practitioner level around the world with mm. simply a blood test in people who have symptoms. And um, this does not take away the need to do a careful assessment, uh, the usual way, history with an informant and ruling out uh, other conditions than dementia. So that's one thing, blood markers. Uh, the other thing that's coming up uh, next year, that was not discussed this morning, but I know it's coming next year, is results uh, partly from Montreal, but partly from London as well, uh, inflammation in the brain. We, mm -hmm. we know, uh, thanks to Dr. McGeer in Vancouver 20 years ago, that if you have arthritis, you're less likely to get Alzheimer. Okay. Much less likely. And we were puzzled by that. And it's because they use anti-inflammatory drugs for arthritis. Oh. That's simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing is, when you give anti-inflammatory drugs like Advil, ibuprofen, simple drugs, everybody knows, to people with symptoms, nothing happens. It's like maybe too late. Or if you give it to people at risk, uh, minimal symptoms, we couldn't show an effect. Um, maybe it's because we don't know how much inflammation there is in their brain to start with. That's changing. So now we have, thanks to the cohort of volunteers at the Center on Aging, the study mm. called TRIAD, a measure, we measure their, the, in the brain using a PET imaging, the inflammation, and in the blood and spinal fluid, proteins that have to do with inflammation. So we hope mm. to be able next year to say whether at any stage of Alzheimer, you have inflammation right now, you should try an anti-inflammatory medicine. What about starting anti-inflammatory medicine before? Like, like what if I took, instead of taking an apple a day, I took an Advil yeah. a day? I mean, would that the thing help? Is, <laughs> the thing is, uh, <laughs> there's a risk of a GI uh, bleed. Um, and uh, for the people who have low risk or no inflammation ongoing at that time, the risk of treatment related bleeding is probably more than the protection you would get out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Uh, other things that are new of interest mm -hmm. to people is uh, there's, as you perhaps know from the recent press, that there was an attempt by the Food and Drug Administration to look at uh, results from a drug that's given intravenously once a month to take out the amyloid from your brain in people who have late onset non-familial Alzheimer. And the results were minimal. If there is an effect, it is small. So the good news is there will be other opportunities uh, so soon next year to try something oral, simpler, pill. It's a drug that was developed in Montreal, of all places, by a Neurochem, 
It's a derivative of a natural amino acid, omotorin, and this medicine will be given as a pill to see if we can prevent or stop the buildup of amyloid proteins in your brain. At the same time, there's a worldwide study with another pill that is given to take out the tau protein. And my hope in the next five years is we can combine both drugs, oral, simple, cheap, Mm-hmm. And the combination will be the treatment of choice, hopefully in five years, hmm. for Alzheimer's disease. So this was a very productive meeting this morning. With yeah, worldwide. in the context of yeah. a world effort to uh, simplify treatments. Uh, it's not realistic mm-hmm. to think of giving injections every month to clinics, uh, expensive uh, injections. I think we have to go simpler, oral. Uh, combination therapy is obvi- obviously the way to go for people who have symptoms, perhaps for prevention in people at high genetic risk. We will need only the anti-amyloid drugs, whether it's IV or oral. But for the average person who's listening here over age 65, hopefully it will be simpler treatment for, let's say, secondary prevention. You already have mild symptoms, but not yet dementia. Mm-hmm. My hope is that we will prove we can delay dementia by three to five years and you die of mm-hmm. something else. That's what I was going to ask you. I guess so. The research is really focused on preventing it, like just before it gets, because when it gets to a certain point, I guess at this point there's nothing you can do. But you're you're so you're trying to catch the disease yep. at the very 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 early stages, right? Yes. To kind of like stop it in place. Yes. Okay. Now to make this research yeah. possible, the yeah. plea that was made at the meeting this morning is people have to get involved. So if you are 60 to 75 in good health, interested in aging, prevention, sign up in whatever cohort there is where you live. Um, these are called trial-ready cohorts. We'll do a complete checkup. We'll have an idea of what kind of protein you're building in your brain. We may not tell you everything if it's not clinically relevant. We don't want you to be stressed for no reason if we don't know what pro- this protein means in the future. But if there is a medication that w- someone wants to test specifically for those people who have such symptoms with that kind of protein in your blood or your brain, you'll be available and we get the study done quickly and efficiently. Your team is, uh, where is your team doing the study? Is it at the Douglas Hospital in Montreal? So we're based right now on the grounds of the Douglas uh, Institute, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now a worldwide effort has been placed on finding a a cure for, uh, for COVID. And you know, it seems like all hands on deck with the scientists and researchers have been go- working towards a vaccine. How has that impacted research in the field of, of dementia? So the sort of the short negative answer is that it has put a halt on some of the ongoing clinical trials um, for, with medications or with non-pharmacological studies, uh, but people are adjusting, for example, there's a study being done in Canada called Tacan Thumbs Up with uh, physical exercises. Uh, it's now done virtually instead of having to go to a gym. So actually, this is now a positive thing. There may be interventions that can be done at a distance, avoiding issues of transport, transportation and so on. Telemedicine uh, has been made possible at an accelerated pace because of the pandemic. I do telemedicine twice a week and people I see uh, by Zoom or I talk to by phone, they're quite happy to stay home. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, this will stay. The other thing is some researchers like uh, our new doctor, Dr. Maya Guedes at the Center on Aging mm-hmm. has uh, put together a, a huge bank of uh, tests that can be done, uh, memory tests and others uh, by Zoom or iPad or iPhone. This also will stay. And uh, it will uh, facilitate research. We can screen for Mm -hmm. people at a distance. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go uh, too far. And uh, maybe some of the long studies in prevention can be done with one visit a year in person. And the follow-up is done at a distance with telecognitive tests, remote Mm -hmm. tests. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other thing that's new is, uh, yeah, we called all the volunteers we had in our cohort. We wanted to know their uh, anxiety in regard to the COVID. And we already are making observations that um, if you have amyloid in your brain, even if you have no symptoms, you're less worried about the COVID impact. So the good news is that if you have uh, Alzheimer pathology, you already have a bit less worry about things happening around you. It's, of course, the, the caregivers worry more or the elderly without 
amyloid uh, pathology or, or symptoms. Uh, the other thing about the pandemic is it made people even more aware of the need for um, caregivers, uh, which you've been um, making us aware of, but there's been an increased awareness mm -hmm. uh, by, by the fact that they were um, separated physically from their loved ones who were in a long-term care facility. Uh, I just want to reassure perhaps some of the listeners that most people I talk to uh, have resilience. Um, the older couples who are living together for the past nine months, they've managed. Um, the kids are more involved, uh, of course, for shopping and providing basic help um, because they have a bit more time because some are off work or they work from home. But 95% of people I've talk talked to in the past nine months have managed reasonably well. But you're right. There is distress. Um, mm -hmm. Social isolation is real. And um, our older uh, families um, are not yet uh, fully at, at ease with Zoom or uh, FaceTime mm -hmm. and similar equipment. That's just something we'll have to take into account in our dementia education program. Mm -hmm. Making so sure like, what seniors would you are aware. So you're, because you sit on so many committees, not only provincial, you sit on national committees, international committees, but what would you say are some of the biggest challenges that families are facing in general right now? I mean, family caregivers and persons with dementia from a, from a... I think we'll find out next month at the Alzheimer's Disease International Congress, which will be virtual, but we're mm -hmm. both presenting there. And uh, I think mm -hmm. it will be the best way to hear from around the world I think uh, despite what happened uh, in the nursing homes in Canada, for the people living in the community, we, we did relatively well in terms of uh, resilience and um, the support we got from the government in terms of subsidies. Uh, the kids were available. I think we did better than uh, some neighbors of ours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it will be interesting to find out at Alzheimer's Disease International how people did and how they fared in South America, notwithstanding all the weather conditions, and uh, Asia and uh, Europe. So we may find we did actually better than many other countries, mm -hmm. despite the social isolation. So until a cure is found, let's talk about the importance of education in terms of managing this disease. And, you know, I feel incredibly grateful to have you as one of the co-academic cool medical leads of our program, the McGill Dementia Education Program. And, you know, I mean, we've known each other for a few years and I've been advocating about the importance of education, but perhaps from a medical perspective, can you talk about education? Indeed, I always knew it was a lack. Uh, when we make a very good diagnosis of dementia, what do we tell the person with dementia if they don't ask? We always told someone, um, usually the legal representative, that we thought there was dementia and that there would be a need for a clarifying uh, power of attorney, advanced power of attorney mandate, uh, making sure the banking is done, uh, that nobody takes advantage of the person. We always talk to already the caregiver, not to the person. What I predict is that the diagnosis will be made earlier and earlier to the point where we really have to talk to the person with mild mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease because they have minimal symptoms and they want to know what's coming in the next five years. Should I continue to work? Uh, then should I give away my car? Uh, there are decisions to be made by the person. So that's the mm -hmm. first shift. Education will be more and more for the very mildly diagnosed persons with Alzheimer's disease, not yet dementia. Second thing is uh, prescription for care, which you've been uh, arguing for, is not easy to do by a specialist who sees the person every six months. It has to be done by the family doctor and hopefully someday uh, a nurse, uh, what do you call a, an infirmière pivot, a nurse that is dedicated. Nurse navigator. Nurse yeah. navigator. I think we have to learn from the cancer model and maybe diabetes or chronic illness model for dementia because there's a sort of trajectory, there are milestones, events happening over six to eight years that we know, it's in the books, uh, but we have to tell the family as much as they want to hear it. Of course, it cannot be done in the first five minutes or even the first hour, but this is where we have uh, together an opportunity to give Alzheimer 101, Alzheimer 102, based on the needs and um, the course of illness as it unfolds. I'm really excited that our program is not only for family caregivers, but that it's really expanded to the medical students so that they really understand the, the, the important role that they play 
in terms of really speaking to the person who has dementia, because, you know, when I'm working with families, unless it's the doctor who says you need to stop driving or it's time to have somebody assist you with managing your finances, if they don't hear that from the doctor, you know, it makes it so much more difficult for family members to make those important decisions. So yeah. I think providing education to the the, 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 the the students who are coming up through the pipeline is, is going to be a big, big benefit. And I think McGill is very ahead of the curve. They also will have the opportunity when they graduate to have the benefit of all the new blood biomarkers, which mm -hmm. will give them a firmer diagnosis. Um, because currently, if you see someone with a history that's a bit vague and you don't have all the facts, we will err on the side of caution and don't talk about dementia, don't talk about mm -hmm. Alzheimer, just talk about brain aging and so on. But if we do have more objective tests uh, and some new treatments uh, that are available if you diagnose early enough, that will change the, the landscape of treatment for Alzheimer dramatically. It's a bit like Parkinson 20 years ago. New drugs. I'm going to I'm going to make sure that we create a link on our website for those people watching who are interested in participating in your studies. So under the resource section, we'll, we will create a link that people could participate in, in the studies that are happening yeah. at your at the your triad center. cohort. Indeed, the stop AD cohort. Yes, there's very, yeah. four cohorts in Quebec. People can join. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, before we end today, could you just talk about your book and how could people get a hold of it? Uh, so, Jude Poirier and I, we wrote uh, eight years ago our first um, book on what to tell the families so they can read it at home. It takes a couple of days to read through. It, it follows the stages of the illness. So, we updated the, the information early this year. It came in January in the bookstores just before the pandemic. But it's available for people who want to know more about the disease. The first edition is available in multiple languages, English, French, Mandarin, German. Portuguese. So the second edition for now, as far as I know, is available in French, but hopefully there'll be translations soon. Any good library like Renaud yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on our show today. Um, really, really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are and I really, really appreciate you being here. A pleasure. Well, next week we have a colleague of Dr. Gauthier coming on. Um, we, the topic is going to be dementia care around the world. And I'm very excited to have Paola Barbarino. She is the CEO of Alzheimer's Disease International based in London, England, and a board member of the World Dementia Council. Just a reminder that this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. I, once again, I would like to thank the Zeller Family Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, we have so many great resources and so many webcasts that you can watch, please go to mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you have specific topics or questions that you would like us to address during our weekly webcast, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Until next week, take good care of your loved ones and yourselves. And thank you for watching.